going to check to see if we have quorum. All right, so we are waiting for one additional council member so that we can meet quorum. And I appreciate your patience. I apologize for the delay of our neighborhood services and education committee. Uh, typically, we begin at 1.30, uh, but for unforeseen reasons, we needed to delay the beginning of our meeting to 2 o'clock, and it is 2 at this moment. Um, and thank you, uh, Council Member Jimenez, for joining us. We are waiting for one additional council member so that we can meet quorum and begin our meeting. You have quorum now, Council Member Arenas. David, uh, council Member Cohen just joined. Oh, okay. I don't see that, but okay. Thank you so much. All righty. Well, welcome to our Neighborhood Services and Education Committee. Uh, today um, is July, <laughs> June 9th. <laughs> I'm already in summer. It, today is June 9th. Um, your chair, Sil uh, Council Member Sylvia Arenas, and we are going to begin with uh, the calling of uh, the roll call, please. Jimenez? Present. Cohen? Here. Esparza? Councilmember Esparza? Arenas? Here. We have a quorum. Wonderful. Um, and then for folks at home, um, you can uh, join us uh, either through uh, cable uh, channel 26 um, or through our YouTube channel. If you uh, plug in City of San Jose YouTube channel, um, and uh, you can also join us by phone at 888 475 4499 um, and uh, click uh, the star sign and nine to raise a hand and speak. All right, so we are going to move forward. Uh, right through uh, past consent and past review of work plan to item uh, reports to the committee. And I'm being told that we will lose quorum at three o'clock, it seems like, but hopefully um, uh, another of our council colleagues will join us by then. All right, we will begin with urban uh, Actually, I think we will begin with an item um, that's last on our agenda, but we are going to prioritize because we have um, our youth commissioners on the line and we want to make sure that they um, are out of here as soon as they can, as they probably have graduations and things of that sort to attend to. So this is item four under the Youth Commission report, and uh, we're gonna hear a verbal report from our youth commissioners on their accomplishments for the fiscal year we're just ending. Go ahead. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Michelle Ornott, Deputy Director of Public Services for San Jose Public Library. It's my privilege to introduce three youth commissioners who will provide today's Youth Commission report. Nicole Huang, Chair of the Youth Commission representing District 3, Commissioner Ananya Sriram, representing District 7, and Commissioner Andrew Liu, representing District 5. Library staff, led by Senior Librarian of Youth Services, Lizzie Nolan, will be available for questions following the presentation. Nicole, it's all yours. Thank you, Ms. Ornott. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As Michelle stated, my name is Nicole B. Huang, and this year I'm the chairperson of the San Jose Youth Commission, the city's official advisory board that represents youth. Our co-presenters today will be District 7 Commissioner Sri Rama and, of course, District 5 Commissioner Lu. Next slide, please. We represent approximately 248,000 youth aged under 19. This year, we transferred to the library department from the PRNS department. Next slide, please. Our work plan this year consisted of five strategic objectives with focus on empowerment, creation of space, equity, awareness, and our duty to advise and prompt city council on youth priorities and input. I will now hand it off to Commissioner Sri Ram to present the next few slides. Thank you. Our first strategic objective focuses on empowerment of youth. We've hosted a plethora of citywide events over the past year, and this year we have 120 active youth advisory council members. Next slide, please. 
One of the Commission's largest projects is the District 3 Annual Survey. This year, Chair Huang's D3 YAC partnered with the Library Department's Annual Teen HQ Survey and collected over 1,000 responses. Next slide, please. We also underwent a rebranding process with a new logo, rebranded merchandise, and social media. Our newsletter has turned into a blog and is now on the San Jose Public Library's website. I will now hand it off to Commissioner Liu for the next slides. For our focus on equity, all Commission general meetings now have a land acknowledgement. We've created multiple policy memorandums under new memorandum format, hosted multiple presentations, acted as the representatives of our community, and hosted community initiatives. Next slide, please. On awareness, we've created a budget letter based on our annual budget summit. The commission adopted a strategic recruitment plan with library staff for our upcoming fiscal year, and we've hosted various events geared towards awareness. Next slide, please. For our fifth objective, we had a focus on social justice, the environment, and social equity in our policy memorandums. I will now hand it back to Chair Huang for, our, for her final slides. Thank you. Next slide, right there. The District 3 Youth Advisory Council reached out to the District 3 Council Office to initiate discussions for a potential policy pipeline. We recently also reported to the Auditor's Office on the San Jose Youth Bill of Rights update. We've created temporary ad hocs, created a rubric on future commission applicants, and updated our policy proposals to memorandum format to be in line with citywide standards. Next slide, please. Our next steps include our annual end of the year event, District 4's annual Aspire, Inspire, Motivate event, and a new Civic Summit in August. Next slide, please. That should be all. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We will go to public comment. Is there anyone waiting to speak? Okay, I don't see anybody and I don't hear anyone from our city clerk's office. Uh, so we are going to um, move on. But before that, I will need a motion to accept the report, please. I'll move to accept the report. I will second. Wonderful. Uh, lastly, before we move on from this item, I just want to thank all of our youth commissioners for uh, your commitment to our city, as well as um, all of the time that you have lent away from uh, your family and, and other special projects uh, to give back to our city. It is always um, such a treat for me to see the input and the perspectives of our youth. Um, it's not something that we get to share and interact with on a on an ongoing basis. And so I look forward to seeing some of the changes. You know, I'm really excited about some of the changes that you're making and as you're making them, um, bringing them back to our neighborhood services and education committee so that we can really work on policy together um, in a very meaningful way. And I know that um, many of you are looking for system changes and it's very loud and clear to us. Um, that we also want to do the same. So thank you so much for all the work that you've done. I see that uh, a colleague of mine has uh, their hand up. Uh, go ahead, Council Member Cohen. Yeah, I, first I wanted to thank the youth commissioners. You do great work and it's all volunteer and I appreciate the time you put in and I know that you, you uh, the things you do in District 4 are great and I know across the city. Just a question, question I'll ask them, although they can answer it later, maybe by setting up a meeting with my office or others about what what resources do you need from the city or do you think the youth commission could use to allow them to be more effective i'll take that question thank you um commissioner cohen that's a great question um i will think on it and work with the team and we will probably connect with your office great thank you Thank you. And it sounds like there's only two commissioners that are um, exiting this year, correct? We have quite a few, actually. We have wonderful oh. graduates. We have about seven. 
seven. Oh no. Well, uh, seven wonderful uh, members of our youth commission that are now moving on and uh, spreading that joy that they, and all the insight that they learned by serving our city. So thank you so much uh, for your service. Um, I, I probably took my notes wrong. So thank you so much and, and uh, congratulations. Uh, and Commissioner uh, Liu and Hong and, and Nolan, uh, thank you all for, for being here today and making the time to report back to us. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work with you this upcoming fiscal year. Of course, thank you for your time. All right, so let's have a, a, a roll call on that vote, please. Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so we are going to move right along to our uh, first presentation, and this is Urban Confluence Silicon Valley Project Quarterly Status Report. Um, who do we have? Oh, Nicole, there you Got are. Got me. Oh, me, I'm here. We're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Council Member. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nicole Burnham, Deputy Director with Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services. And hopefully you can see my screen and I should be in slideshow mode. Is that true? Okay, you're seeing a slideshow? Yes. We're seeing a slideshow, although it has a next slide right next to it, side to side. Let me, uh, let me work on that again then. Hmm. Let's try this one. Still? Oh, or is it Perfect. Okay. Whew. Thank you. Um, so happy to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm also joined today by Steve Borkenhagen, and he should be on the panelist side. I probably should have led with that. Can we make sure that he's in the panelist queue? Ruth, um, do you see him? And I apologize. I should have checked before I even started the presentation. Sure. You, said, you okay. say his name again? Steve Borkenhagen? I don't see him in the attendees side. Yeah. I don't see him on there either. Interesting. Okay, let me text him, make sure he's coming back. I'm so sorry about that. Nicole, should we uh, come back to your presentation? Yeah. Uh, Okay, so we, we're going to move on to yeah, items. let's do that and I'll um, yeah move on and then I can you can I'll come back. Perfect, perfect. Let me know. All right, so we're going to move on to um, I or we're going to skip skip this item for now and move on to citywide residential anti displacement strategy quarterly status report. This is item two on our agenda. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> I, you're moving a little faster than I thought you were. And I haven't been in the committee for so long. I don't know if we have to share the PowerPoint. And it sounds like maybe we do. So okay. let me, I don't know, Emily, if you have it. Let me grab it. Sorry. Certain if I have the absolute final one. So. Okay, I have it. Here it goes write this off as summer itis that uh we're all feeling <laughs> and uh and i'm gonna blame budget a little bit for for throwing us off our energy this month i only have a million things opened on my computer so i'm trying to quickly get rid of them all right here we go sorry awesome uh share my screen All right, uh, thank you, uh, um, city council members. I'm Jackie morales friend. I'm the director of housing. I'm joined today uh, by Emily Hislop, and I hope I didn't uh, mispronounce your name, Emily. She has just recently, be, recently been hired to lead uh, our 
uh, rent stabilization programs. And so she's going to be giving that part of the report. So just to remind you what we have been focused on in the housing department are four different strategies. So we have been a uh, partner in working, of course, citywide on the equitable COVID-19 response and recovery. Uh, we are continue to work on anti-displacement and neighborhood tenant preferences, the COPA program, and then, of course, your direction from the city council to have an unrepresented, to look at unrepresented communities on our commissions, which include, includes lived experience. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Emily right now. Uh, thank you, council committee members. Um, so I'm gonna start out just giving an update on the state rental assistance program. Um, as of May 29th, there were 12,492 completed applications from city of San Jose households, um, totaling $187.3 million in rent requested. And so far, $107.7 million um, dollars has been paid on behalf of 9,394 households, you, most of the time paid directly to the landlord. And um, we want to point out that 89 million of this, like 83% of it, has gone to very low income and extremely low income households. Um, so these are people making 50% of the area median income on extremely low is 30% of the area median income, our most hardest hit. Um, approximately 50% of the applicants are from Latinx headed households. Um, and as I pointed out, the total number for very and extremely low income households, 64% of these are extremely low income households. Um, I'll just quickly note before we go to the next slide that in our eviction help centers, we've assisted 1600 households um, of this 12,000 number, at least um, assisting them all the way through the application process and um, believed 65% or more were Spanish speaking and um, a large 75% uh, or more were from extremely low income households. So that was our city's contribution to this, um, the st statistics you see here. Next slide. Um, as we covered in council in March, um, there was of course at the 11th hour, a bill passed AB 2179 that extended some limited eviction protections through June 30th um, against eviction based on non-payment of rent accumulated before March 31st, 2022, where the tenant had a state application uh, pending. I, um, I, yeah, yeah, I use the link and I'm, I'm in. Oh. Um, could, it, okay. Dave, could you please mute your, oh, great, thank you. Thank you. Um, but this legislation also extended through June 30th a statewide preemption of local laws that would address COVID-19 rental debt, which meant that local jurisdictions are preempted from applying new or additional local protections against eviction for non-payment of rent if the rent accrued between March 1st, uh, 2022, I think that should be actually 2020, and um, yes. Oh, can you go back one slide? I just want, had a couple notes about the end of those protections. Just to note, um, as of June 4th, the state had about 2,300 applications left for San Jose residents in process. And um, we anticipate get them getting through most of those by June 30th. And there is a process that works very well to expedite a tenant's application if they receive a notice to pay or if they receive an unlawful detainer lawsuit. The state has been very responsive at expediting those and getting them processed within, within a couple days. Okay, next slide. Um, so in response to the, when we thought the protections were ending in March 31st, uh, we worked quickly, quickly with the county and Sacred Heart and other um, community partners to develop a temporary targeted program where we could intervene in evictions of tenants who have state um, rent relief applications pending, we're calling it the eviction diversion and settlement program. And this is utilizing some leftover um, ERA one money from the first tranche of rent rental assistance we received that initially funded the local program. So this is program is jointly administered by the city and county. Um, the other partners are Sacred Heart Community Services, Destination Home and Project Sentinel Court mediation program. 
this program is only for tenants who have a pending eviction court case, an unlawful detainer, and who submitted a state application prior to April 1st of this year, um, and that that application has not been approved. We are able to work with the tenant and the landlord, um, have a court settlement worked out, we pull the application, we can cover the arrearage. And the great thing is that we are still only for this program, we are also able to cure some April, May, and June um, rental arrearages, whereas the rent relief program cut off at March 31st. Um, so this has been uh, very successful. We are, have, are in court two to three days a week because the calendar is now spilling over into a third day where we our staff identifies possible cases and works with landlord attorneys and the parties and the, the day of court volunteer mediators. Um, it's very much a collaborative process and um, everyone knows each other. Landlord attorneys come and seek us out. Um, the courts, we also get referrals um, for possible cases from the court self-help center, legal aid organizations, our own eviction help centers, and even landlord attorneys who know that the, the application stalled out and their client just wants to get paid, but they have, they filed the action. Um, and I just wanna note that if a tenant or a case is not eligible for our, this particular program, we are still connecting them with Sacred Heart for screening and other mediation services and resources um, or referred to legal services. We don't just give them a phone number and send them on their way. We make sure they're getting as much access to resources as possible to try to resolve um, their eviction lawsuit without resulting in a judgment or a court trial. Next slide. Okay, separate from, we do have this temporary eviction diversion program that's just for these pending rent relief applications and will only run through the summer. Um, but in a separate development, which is very exciting, mid-May, we were able to secure a courtroom space in the downtown courthouse to hold an unlawful detainer clinic. Um, this was has been an effort in the making for years um, to establish some place where we have uh, Sacred Heart Community Services, court self-help, um, all sorts of resources for both litigants to just go to one place and be able to get access to all of that to try to resolve the court case. Um, so we established this clinic um, at the Superior Courthouse on June 1st. Um, our current partners are the court, the county, the court self-help center, Sacred Heart, Destination Home, and of course the Project Sentinel Court Mediation Program mediators. Um, it's open to both tenants and landlords who are involved in unlawful detainer court actions. Uh, they can get assistance with court filings from self-help that's there, legal referrals. We have an, a mediation referral if the, the case is active um, to help the parties try to work out a settlement without going to trial. Um, Sacred Heart is there to screen tenants for um, possible rental assistance or for HPS um, when they have an active case, but they just need things paid or need help moving into a new space. All this is um, to help resolve, uh, resolve the court action and avoid judgment um, and work towards getting people in stable housing. The, the long-term goal is for the clinic to become a permanent part of the UD process. And we hope to expand this clinic to offer more services uh, to litigants. And I think that is my last slide. It is, and again, I just wanted to thank Emily for her work on getting this court uh, piece set up. It has been something we've been trying to get off the ground for years, and it's really exciting to actually have the courts being willing to participate in a program like this. So we're very pleased with that. Uh, the last part of the presentation is really gonna focus on the anti-displacement piece of the tenant preferences. So uh, we are in the process of trying to work through a bill through the state. Um, it's 649 and actually I think it's gonna be either heard I think it's being heard next week. We've been working on getting letters of support uh, to get this moving. This would allow us to uh, implement some uh, tenant preference regulations locally by acknowledging that it is a state interest to do this. Uh, 
Uh, we're still working, trying to work through uh, the State Department of Housing and Community Development uh, to get some guidance out to us so that we can implement a tenant preference ordinance. And we're working on trying to expand our staffing uh, to assist us in this area. In terms of an update on the Community Opportunity to Purchase Program, uh, at this point, we have deferred this item until the fall because staff has needed to put all of their efforts in getting our housing element done. So we are continuing to work with our partners in terms of meeting with them to continue to work on at least the uh, proposed program so that we can get uh, running in early fall with a proposal for the city council to consider. And we have received a fellow uh, through the San Francisco Foundation, and they'll be helping us uh, with this work as we continue moving forward. And then just in terms of now implementing your direction, which is to include a lived experience seat on our housing commission and an alternative seat. We're working with the clerk to amend our commission application and the recruitment. Uh, the position will be, the new commissioner gets, will be appointed by the mayor, and we're working on trying to put some support programs into place. It has been a little bit challenging because the person who was working on it uh, left the housing department, and so we're in need of hiring a new person to help us to finish with the implementation of this process. So over the next three months, you can see our activities, which is we're gonna to continue to work in the courts. Um, one thing that uh, we did not originally request that this memo go forward to, to the city council for consideration on their agenda. However, as we were reviewing the dates, I just wanted to highlight that the protections that we had are expiring again, the end of this month. And if the city council wanted to take any action, it would be important to have something on the agenda. So if you all believe that it's uh, important to give the council an opportunity to discuss the uh, legislation again on the state level that is expiring, then I would request that you put this on the agenda and the housing department would issue a supplemental to this memo uh, providing more detail on the expiration of the state protections. Uh, again, you can see what we'll be doing on tenant preferences, which is continuing our work to get the state to respond. We will come back on COPA this fall, and then the goal is to get all of the work done on the commissioner seat uh, by the end of this year. So with that, we are open for questions. Great, thank you uh, for that presentation. Um, we're gonna go to public comment. Shani? Shani, go ahead, please. Giovanni? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I was just wanted to comment uh, uh, as a middle class to lower income per person representing my community. Um, I just wanted to say we have to be uh, careful for, uh, be very careful for landlords too, to not take, to not be taken advantage of and be fair as well. Some landlords work their whole lives to own a property and start something great, like a great investment that should be able to be passed down to the families without like, you know, great tax hikes. I know that's separate from this, but forcing hardworking people that come from the bottom to sacrifice their real estate investments, it's it's not fair. So I just think that uh, renters shouldn't have more rights than the landlords, especially the ones that worked their whole life to be able to afford that real estate. Uh, that's all I have. Jill Borders. Hi, thank you. 
Um, I just wanted to comment as far as an anti-displacement strategy. I hope that we can move forward. This is like a sort of a philosophical discussion, but I've been waiting to find the right time to begin the conversation that I think we need to have, which is that, for example, I live in a mobile home park, and now I have the privilege because I own more than a renter. I have the privilege embedded within state law to protect and municipal law that protects me from being displaced without compensation, without, you know, uh, all kinds of protections for me. I can still, you know, of course be booted out. There's a, that whole deal. But what my point is, is this, is the more you have in our society, the more protections you have. And that's a fact. I'm at a point in my life where I know that. I know that to be true. So what I want to discuss and start discussing is that land that we're all born on is something that we are inherently, you know, we have an inherent right to occupy, to live on. And so the last caller talked about land ruler rights, absolutely. But that is, for example, Thomas Paine would say, that's, you know, a human man-made function. We created laws that protect people because we've decided that we can title land. But if you're born to parents who are renters and to grandparents who were renters, and then you are a renter, where is the justice for you in the land that you naturally inherited? So that is where we need to start talking about basic, you know, um, income being dispersed so that it can compensate for the injustice of your land rights being taken away. Thank you. Back to the committee. Wonderful, thank you. I see council member Esparza. Thank you. And I had a question. Are we uh, accepting both reports? So the anti-displacement report as well as the rent stabilization plan combined or? No, this is, uh, the, this this is just separate. items. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so uh, I just wanted to clarify and apologize for being late. I just came from an event. Um, so I had a question about the legal assistance. So Project Sentinel, how is that working? Is that a ref on a specific referral basis? Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, so Project Sentinel provides the day of court mediation services. Those are neutral. Um, we do have relationships with uh, Law Foundation and Bay Area Legal Aid and already have a process through our Eviction Help Center to make referrals to them when we have people come in with unlawful detainers. Um, maybe some, give me a context of, um, because we have referrals in, in, in different places in the eviction process. So maybe if you can be more specific. Well, that. so, uh, and I'll tell you what I'm getting at is, is I, I would like to see a little bit more specifics of the uh, cases that we're assisting on in each group. It's very confusing. Um, and so I'm trying to understand it. My office has gotten calls and we've actually made referrals to the Law Foundation. Um, and I've, I, so this is, I was going, starting with the Project Sentinel issue, but on the Law Foundation issue, I've heard back from residents that they haven't been able to get through. The phone intake is only in the morning. So if you work, you know, it's difficult. The in-person is in the afternoons. Um, and so it's very confusing in terms of what you can get when. Um, and then what I'm getting at too is the number of, cases in um, households, however you want to define casework, um, how, how much of a caseload each of the legal providers is taking on for this work? Um, well, first of all, I would encourage you to have your residents contact the Eviction Help Center because we can take it from there and make sure knowing what their need is, what the best way to meet it is. Um, and I think- Those hours are during the day though. That. If they call, they will get a call back um, during, the, if, if they call or email us, they will be contacted the next day. I can also come in person. We do have hours one to eight at the Franklin McKinley site. So, and the, um, the phone's being answered in the evening on that day. Right, and right. but point, it's confusing. If you go and you find out where to get that help, you know, it's confusing what you get where, and it's confusing to my residents. And that's why I'm asking. And we've had folks come back to me 
to my office saying that they're confused about this, that they're not getting help. Um, and, and I, and you may know to go to the Frank McKinley and I know you've been there from day one, right? But, but, um, but folks are unaware of the differences because between Law Foundation, the City Eviction Help Center, um, and the Frank McKinley site's the only um, non-work hour, typical work hour location to get assistance. And those are some of the things. So how convenient we can make it for folks to get help um, and then also, because uh, they're dealing with childcare and, and, and they work, they just don't work eno enough, right? To, that they're dealing with arrears and all sorts of stuff. Um, and so the, the making it accessible to folks. And then also I'm trying to understand because I've had folks that we referred to the Law Foundation that the Law Foundation is kicked back. Like, so they're, they're you know, so I'm trying to understand this process myself. Okay, um, first off, we, I, we hear your concerns about different doors and where to send people and everything. And our effort you know, for the past at least nine months, 10 months or more is to make this be a hub, to have tenants call one number. We, tr we um, have worked with the county, countywide, to have a flyer that mimics and that when they're, if they see the flyer in San Jose, it's always going to have 974-444. It's going to have the email address. It's going to have the hours of where we're open. For the county, it may be another number. It doesn't matter if they call one or the other. They're going to get access and get connected to resources. We are tr trying very hard to get away from saying, call Sacred Heart call law foundation we're like okay what is your issue we're going to take your information and get you to the right person here's places where you can go that might fit like if they have an unlawful detainer we know that that's urgent our staff is trained in that we know they may not have enough time to wait for the weekly unlawful detainer clinic but we know that self-help is open and self-help will help every morning at the court they take those as emergency and they will help people file an answer. So Law Foundation has, as many legal aid organizations have had some um, serious capacity issues. There's just a hiring you know, shortage. There's a shortage of people to hire. They you know, lose them who go to other jobs. So we're trying to work around that and figure out how most to effectively use the resources that they do have and um, get the, ten the tenant the proper help and then maybe at a certain point, we can make that referral to Law Foundation when they need the, the legal advice. But I, I mean, if you have people contacting your staff, um, I would encourage you to email those people to, to the eviction help or email us with that tenant contact info so we can reach out and try to clear up. I really, we just want there to be one flyer. The Right now it's a three-step flyer and that they call the, if they, they can't call until the evening on a Wednesday. Somebody will pick up after six. So that's a good time to call. Um, they will get called back. We um, do have the function to text. Um, so we can text people back if they want information about where to go and they can request a text back with that information. Um, that's really helpful. Thank you for that. Yes. Okay. Cause so, I think the texting is big if yeah. you're at work, right? Yeah. And um, you can't really talk um, to be able to get that. So thank you. And we enabled that too. So people could send us a picture of whatever document they have, and then we can help them figure out what's going on. Um, but they have to call first. So we don't just have an open text line. Right, yeah. And we've referred people to the phone number and, and have told them that they'll get someone back. I think where it gets confusing is um, when folks see the Law Foundation and then they go to the Law Foundation and they're not getting the same level of service, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, so uh, I think it would be helpful if on our side, uh, on our side, we're already using this, but did we, we have the flyers that we've made that has the bubbles, right? Um, is there something that um, is a little bit more, has the different logos, like, these places have all these organizations at them. If you call this number and leave, leave a message, like this is the one flyer to rule them all, right? For lack of a, a better term. Um, 
I'm trying to recall what our current flyer is that we should probably update now that protections are ending. Um, I think we do include all the logos um, on our court flyer. There's been different versions because of the changes. Yeah. 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 Um, but we're receptive to this um, input and we work with the county and other partners to make sure we're all doing the same thing. Um, for our unlawful detainer clinic flyer, we have multiple logos on there. Um, and that's just one flyer. And we it's only been fi just recently finalized and we will get it out there and we will get it to council members with um, in instructions of like who should be given, you know, who who's can be served at that. I mean, that's really just somebody who's gotten court papers. Okay. But we'll um, take that back and, and okay. That. Thank you, thank you, and I'm happy to help okay. offline too as well. We can um, check in, um, and I. Uh, so we need in the accepting the report um, in order to have an update come back to council this month before it ends. Does that need to be included into the motion? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, I'll move to accept this report and refer the. Um, uh, of, what is it, moratorium update uh, to the full council by the end of June. That's the motion. I will second Better. it. Oh, Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Darn it. I know that I had some questions that have already been answered, um, but one that I was thinking about as um, the presentation um, was happening is uh, under recommendation for, and I know that this uh, milestone um, was delayed a bit because of um, the loss of a, of a staff person um, moving on somewhere else. Um, and it, it got me to think about how, um, how do we ensure that the, the, the contractors or the, the agencies that we contract with look like and have and reflect the diversity of the community that they serve, as well as our own staff? How do we ensure our own staff also reflects the community that we are serving, um, not only with uh, maybe a path uh, experience of um, of uh, being unhoused, but also in, in terms of the diversity, um, because I did hear loud and clear that there is a lot of Spanish speakers that were being served. So Emily's staff has, uh, and actually I'll turn it to Emily to talk about the level of bilingual, bicultural staff you have in both the uh, eviction help center. Um, so in both locations, we have multiple Spanish speakers on hand and not just Spanish, like I speak Spanish, but native Spanish speakers, um, culturally appropriate. Um, we also have Mandarin speaker is speaking staff and um, we are hiring, we're, we're onboarding a couple, a few more Vietnamese speaking staff because some had gone back to school, um, but we, we don't we don't don't go a day without we always have at least one Spanish speaking staff member at both locations. All of our staff is well versed in using um, the language access line um, and use it um, probably at least once a week, I imagine. So if their Spanish speaking staff member happens to be at lunch or something, somebody is still um, assisted. Mm -hmm. Okay, one, wonderful. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, are, is that language access line also available after hours or during the some of the hours that, that you were uh, discussing with Council Member Esparza? So we have um, one day a week where we're open one to eight. Um, we have it's it we make sure that there's a Spanish speaking member of staff who's there in the evening and we do have a full time receptionist who is Spanish speaking. So she is there those evenings and wouldn't be at lunch. Um, and if she were out sick, we'd make sure somebody else covered it. But we haven't had a need for that um, as far as I'm aware. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if the, the language, I believe it might be um, available after hours because some are for medical facilities. So I imagine ERs might contact them. 
Yeah, I, I would imagine that it's not only just Spanish, but Vietnamese is, mm -hmm. is probably the other language uh, that it is needed. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad to, uh, that there is some level of, of service that's being rendered, whether it's in this language access line or it's through the staff that um, are hired. So that takes care of the language. How about that experience um, in terms of, of uh, the unlived experience, if you will? What, is that something that we prioritize as well? Um, when I'm hiring staff, I, one of the, the things I look for is compassion for the community, and some of that may come out of their own experience. Our staff members come from all different backgrounds. Anecdotally, there's one staff member I heard more than one occasion instruct somebody how to apply for a Section 8 voucher because they had gone through that experience themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so. That's a priority in our hiring that, I mean, I think probably housing wide <laughs> that, you know, that we're looking for people that um, are passionate about the community. And for a lot of them, that means because they're coming from um, the impacted communities. Yes, I, I would just add that many of the staff are either um, immigrants themselves or first generation. Got it. And is that something that we also look for in our contracted staff um, to ensure that there is that language capacity or, and, you know, just that representation and diversity in the staff? So I'm going to just jump in to say when we originally, you know, began the rental assistance program, working with Destination Home, that was done by actually contracting with groups that were embedded in communities. And so that they were all uh, majority located in their communities or part of their communities. And that that program is something we continue to support through our homeless prevention funding, uh, which is pushing the money out to community-based organizations. Um, Jackie, I can add that we have ongoing outreach engagement in partnership with the county with um, groups like Amigos de Guadalupe um, that are use the Promodora approach to education and outreach, and we've extended that um, that contract. So, yeah, it would be really interesting for us also to have uh, an arm of of Promotoras in within our own programming. Uh, Jackie, you you, you um, all function like promotoras, uh, and then also do the policy work, which and do the program and you know whatnot. I, I think it's a, a huge stretch uh, in terms of the staff. I it would be wonderful to start thinking about how do we um, integrate that promotoras um, outreach and and format within the services that you offer um, so that you can have that as an ongoing, uh, you know, just stable um, part of the, the department. Actually, you know, we started working with the promotoras like four years ago, four or five years ago when we started our contracting um, and actually have, you know, they have been key in a lot of our community work. Uh, in doing outreach. And when we did the anti-displacement work, so that had to be three years ago, four years, they actually helped to do the outreach. They did some of the arranging and facilitating of meetings. And so we have a very good relationship uh, uh, with uh, Summers Mayfair and the collective that have helped us to uh, integrate uh, the Promotora work within our housing functions, which is why we, you know, we primarily started that work through our policy work, actually. We've been able to cross it over through our uh, rental work. Um, and so we're very strong supporters of the model uh, and use it quite frequently. Because we know they're connected, the, the groups that we're trying to reach out to, they already have a natural connection to, and they do a much better job in reaching out than we could possibly 
and they're trusted within their communities. So, right. you know, it is something that we hope to be able to fund more of uh, in the work that we do. I was just thinking about that. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear. Uh, let let the folks who do it best do it and continue to do it and, and maybe just fund it and expand it. Um, that is actually a, a wonderful thought. Um, it, a lot of the times, I, you know, and I don't know the experience um, from the housing department and those contractors, uh, because, it, it, you know, we're, we're just, uh, we have a, some distance between us, um, but it's, it would be interesting to learn um, how many of them have a promotor uh, format, how many of them rely that way, how effective that strategy is um, for programming. Um, you know, we default back to the promotoros program because we know that our community that is very difficult to reach and um but also needs to uh to be reached during non-traditional hours and with uh, specific language capacity um it would just be really interesting to find out how how well um those contracted agencies are serving the community. Um, I know we've we've talked about this in in council and just different uh, segments of uh, the de uh, Department of Housing, um, and and as I was thinking about the very specific program that you have um, for uh, for those folks who uh, are in the court system who meet just very, very specific parameters that um, you'd be able to pull those folks out possibly from uh, some of the promotora programs, but uh, obviously you're going through the courts um, as well. And, and the, those folks who are in the court system will find themselves uh, hopefully served by you, but then those who don't know um, what their rights are may never find a pathway um, into the court system may never connect with the Department of Housing or any of those contracted agencies and just simply um, leave our our count our city our county um, for for a less expensive place um, because they just really never had anybody to to connect with there wasn't a system that touched them in in a way that was helpful and meaningful so so anyways, I, I continue just to, to ask those questions because I know that um, we, we haven't seen the worst of it. I know, I feel like it's always around the corner and, and you are all helping us stave that off, um, but we're, 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 we're just going to see it, continue to see it in, in the schools that get closed. Anyways, uh, thank you uh, for that feedback. I appreciate it. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jackie. One more thing. I mean, the, the, uh, what is also required by uh, law is that uh, eviction notices have to be sent to the housing department. So landlords are required to send those eviction notices and they start with what we call a three-day demand. The three-day demand means you have three days in which to pay that rent. And if not, then the um, the landlord can take you to court. So we have two touch points there. So we get those three day demands uh, where we follow up with people and we follow up at the point when they're getting the actual eviction notice. And so while again, it could be that it's coming from a government entity, we're saying you have these rights, um, and Emily took herself off the mic, so I'll let her finish, but we do proactively try to reach out to people as well. Um, and I wanna say we go so far as we've been asking people permission to like reach out to them again, if we need anything and we have their phone number and name, we pulled the UDs that got filed. We looked up to see if the tenants had visited us at some point. And in this past month, we found six where people we had contact info and we had our staff reach out to them. So we're trying to use every opportunity to reach people and not wait for them to come to us. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, did, we, did we vote on this? We made a motion. No vote just yet. Karen, you got me? Yes, we need a vote. <laughs> All right, we need a vote. Thank you, Jackie. Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Uh, yes. Thank you.
Wonderful. Okay, so we're going to move on to rate the rent stabilization program strategic plan report. And guess what? We have Jackie and Emily back again. Oh, and Rachel. <laughs> awesome. Hello. Good afternoon, um, committee. Um, this presentation, um, of course, Jackie and Emily are, will be nearby and will be joining us. Um, but today, my name is Rachel Vanderveen. I'm Deputy Director of the Housing Department, and I will be joined today by Noel, who is our um, Senior Analyst with the Rent Stabilization Program, and we will be making the presentation to you. And Emily will also be available for any questions that might come up. Next slide, please. So we are here today to provide an update for all of you on the Rent Stabilization Program Strategic Plan. The purpose of this plan is to address the overall implementation and effectiveness of the ordinances managed by our program. The areas of focus for our strategic plan include, at first, broadly, we want to understand how these ordinances work together to provide stability to our residents. Second, we want to further fair housing and ensure through evaluation that people of color are receiving protections from our program in equitable ways. Third, we want to provide we want to build positive relationships between residents and property owners. And as we do this work, we want to be thinking about how we can preserve mobile homes and mobile home parks and provide protections and um, continue to have mobile homes serve as a source of affordable housing in our community. I will now be turning the presentation over to Noelle. Hi, thank you, Rachel. Uh, I'm Noel Padilla. I'm the senior analyst for with the Rent Stabilization Program, and so uh, I'll uh, I'll be providing an overview of each ordinance and how the strategic plan will reflect and measure the effectiveness of each ordinance. So we'll start off with the apartment rent ordinance, which provides place uh, which places limits on allowable rent increases for properties that are covered. Um, and provides the ability for tenants and property owners to file petitions with the program for various reasons. Uh, there is a need to understand the impact of the ARO um, that it truly has on the rent stabilized community in comparison to that of market rate units. Um, and regarding the tenant protection ordinance, there's a need uh, to further evaluate the compliance with the various aspects of the tenant protection ordinance and its intent to prevent unjust evictions um, as any notice determination or unlawful detainer requires a just cause as uh, dictated by the tenant protection ordinance. Um, and throughout the strategic plan, there will be an evaluation of the internal mechanisms for monitoring compliance of the Ellis Act ordinance, as well as developing a means of analysis to better understand the why and how for removal of these properties and the displacement of tenants. And finally, uh, there will be an exploration of the various features of the mobile home rent ordinance to determine the impact and limitations of the ordinance itself. And so the department has selected RSG Incorporated as the consultant for this project through a competitive request for proposals process. Uh, the following is the timeline that was proposed by RSG towards uh, the development of the strategic plan. And so over the course of the next year, um, they'll be uh, conducting analysis, review, um, outreach to our stakeholders, and, commu and our community in order to um, essentially develop a, a strong strategic plan for that the program can implement. All right, and that concludes our presentation. So we're available for any questions that you might have.
Wonderful, thank you. Um, we're gonna move over to public comment. Giovanni? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this kind of like relates to what I was saying before, protecting Latino and people of color that have worked hard from the bottom to earn some wealth. The American dream is so hard to achieve by this real estate power grab. I wanna make sure that we don't destroy the, the, the people don't, that the renters don't destroy their properties too and allow pests to nest such as bugs. Landlords that started from the, from the bottom uh, shouldn't have to submit to one-sided renter protection. We have to make sure it's fair on both sides. I understand renters need protection, but there's a lot of landlords that started from nothing that are having to sell their homes because they can't even afford to keep them anymore to rent. It's, it's kind of ruining dreams and, and they want to pass these homes to their children. It's harder and harder to do. We have to give them back to the bank and it, it's just not fair. I just want to make sure that we protect us Latinos and people of color, which I'm a mixture of both as well. So I have to speak, I have to speak from our side too. It's not just Latino and people of color that rent. There's also people of color that, that are landlords as well. And we need, we need protection and not to be taken advantage of. So I just wanted to make sure that it's going out there. Thank you. Jill Borders. Hi, thank you. I just want to chime in here because I'm a beneficiary of um, the program that uh, rent stabilization in mobile home parks. And so every single year we are, I feel so blessed that we are able to have our mortgage. So we pay our mortgage and then every single year our rent goes up 3%, our space rent goes up 3%. And I'm actually able to plan out until like 2035, 2040 with that percentage. And so it tells me exactly where I am. So as my mortgage is re being reduced, um, I'm taking a look at my property taxes, which are steadily slightly going up. And then I take a look very closely at then where my space rent is. But because all of that is stable and predictable, it has created this really amazing stability for me and my family, which I've mentioned many times in meetings. And in our particular park, I wanna make it very clear how lucky I am because we have protections that if the land owner wanted to sell, we have protections. We have protections for rent stabilization. Um, we have insurance protections. We have all kinds of these protections which create stability, which is really what we have in San Jose is a stability crisis. And so I can't say enough about how grateful I am for it. And the second thing I wanna say is basically that our park is a 100% owner occupied park. No one is allowed to buy a mobile home park, mobile home and rent it out. You either, you, if you live here, you're on the title. And what that does is also create an entire neighborhood of people who are paying their mortgage and paying their space rent. And we're all in this together. And um, I just think that I wish somebody would study our park and, and see how decades and decades long people have been here. It's an amazing um, study in what works. So thank you. I hope someone will study it. Thanks. Back to the committee. Sorry, I don't see any hands. Oh, there we go. Uh, Council Member Sparza, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I um, I wanted to ask about a couple of things. So I, I'm I've been a beneficiary of the apartment rent ordinance. In fact, when I got elected, I was a, I lived in an ARO unit, and um, and so I'm I'm aware of the protections and the amount of stability this gives a lot of families, um, and. Uh, and, it, and it's been interesting living through COVID, I mean, this kind of relates to the last item a little bit, is um, during COVID, uh, the higher rent apartments uh, actually have lowered rents. It's apartments in places like District 7, uh, District 5, um, parts of District 3 that have seen increases uh, before the moratorium and then, or the moratoria, right? All the different ones. And then once those end, um, it's it's the working class apartments that are going up. And, and I just want to correct something 
the vast majority of units that are owned in San Jose are owned by out of town corporations. Um, and I'll, I'll spare uh, a lecture on who owns what, but the vast majority of these units um, are not mom and pops. Um, they're corporations who are not in San Jose, not in Santa Clara County. Um, and, uh, and so, um, you know, I wanted to address that, but I also wanted to ask a question on the, um, the, the, um, the rent increases. Are we including, um, can you talk a little bit more about the units that we're including in the study? Sure, I can respond to that. This is Rachel. So this study is going to be focusing on, well, actually we have an opportunity to broaden the study because um, what the, the questions that are gonna be asked about the study are, are really looking at residents of San Jose, right? So, um, so our ordinances provide protections to different groups. Our apartment rent ordinance provides protections to people living in triplexes or larger that were built before 1979. And then our tenant protection ordinance provides protections to triplexes or larger, no matter when they were built. Um, and I think that what we want to do in this study is see, are there gaps? Are there gaps in who's being protected? So that's one of the things we want to explore. Thank you. And then, um, um, so are we looking at all housing stock in this study? Yes, we, we can and we would like to. Okay, okay. I, that's also what I wanted to, to double check. Um, so we're going to look at all housing stock. And then um, as that's pulled up, are, are we going to be able to review it? Um, for example, um, because again, I, I have seen this during COVID, you know, um, you know as, as a renter during COVID, seeing all the interesting things going on um, on the higher end apartments. They were cutting rents, um, doing incentives for people to rent, but on the lower income side, um, there were folks under a tremendous amount of pressure and folks that were getting evicted, even though we had eviction protections. Um, and so are we gonna be able to look at um, income and geography and the size of the units and, and one of the things I'm really interested in, Rachel, is also on the housing developments. Um, if the city has um, an investment, if we've used a bond um, in some of these developments, um, can we identify that in this uh, study? Because that would be helpful information for us to then review that and see what additional options and processes we might have as a city as we extend bonds um, moving forward. I think that's a really important consideration that we have. And we only have a sort of a once in a lifetime of the bond chance to do that. And so um, I'd be interested in, in knowing that as well. So I just want to clarify, um, would it be helpful then for us to include, so we would have our um, rent stabilization housing stock, we'd have an affordable housing stock that is either affordable by bonds or by our financing, then we would have market rate housing stock. That would be really, really great. Okay. That would be helpful. Do you need direction from us or can you just include it in the study? We'll just include it. In okay. Study. Okay. That would be really, really helpful because um, as you know, Jackie, I'm, I'm eager to, to take additional uh, very thoughtful steps moving forward on opportunities that we might have as a city. Um, okay. Uh, and, and I'm happy to move to accept the report. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Awesome. Well, let me do a follow-up uh, question um, on that item. We know that uh, Council Member Esparza was 
describing um, some of the trends that she's noticed on um, higher end apartments and the lower end apartments and the rent and what was happening with the rent. Um, I know that there's a lot of folks who may own their homes outright and are just renting them or selling them as we've seen the market continues you know uh, to be relatively a hot market um although it's been slowed down since the interest rates went up um do we know if if uh the city has uh, if the large corporations that and this has happened throughout the nation if there's been a lot of purchase of single family homes in our city um, through big corporations um, and then renting them out. Uh, this is something that I, that, uh, and I forgot what some of the states said it was happening in, but it's a trend that's been happening um, in other parts of our nation um as a way to invest in obviously with real estate but also to control that that rent uh that rental market is that something that you would be also uh potentially looking at this is rachel um we we could definitely look at it we don't have information mean, i don't have information to date on this question but it is an interesting question just even this past week got a call from another jurisdiction who was who was looking into this same issue so i think it's something that um has been trending across the country i think what's we'll, we'll, we will definitely have to look into it and i want to provide you with a data driven answer um i just from my gut i um i'd be interested to see just because the home prices are so high here in san jose so like the the latest median income price to purchase a home is 1.7 million so i just have like a little hunch that it may be more difficult to actually purchase multiple single family homes here in san jose with that model whereas maybe in other parts of the country it would um, be more profitable. But again, that's it's a good question and we can we can look at it because we know that other housing agencies in the in throughout the country are are really asking the same question. Yeah. Well thank you. I, I hope that we can figure that piece out and get ahead of it as well. Um, the the other piece of this is will we look at the not it's naturally occurring because we uh, families do this to survive in this valley, um, but the 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 uh, tripling up, doubling up of families in single family homes um, and utilizing those as, as kind of a multiplex uh, versus a single family home is are, will you take stock in that type of inventory as well. Yes, we can take a look at um, overcrowding as an, uh, a consideration as we look at the policies. Great. Um, and will that include also um, garage conversions? I'm just trying to think here. Um, we can no, we I'm can, adding a lot of a lot of cash. I know. I'm just thinking about this is how this, this is how families make it, right? This is how they keep their their homes and create opportunities for rent. Right. So I guess what I would just say is that we'll be looking we'll um, be looking at data across the city where anyone lives, and we'll be including that in our analysis. I don't know that I can promise you today that we'll have information specifically about garage conversions, just because that's not necessarily like the focus of this study. Um, yeah. But we will, but because they are our residents, they will be considered. Sure. I just think that they're, uh, of course, a market that we don't typically talk about that um, I think needs to uh, have the attention and support that they also need to um come into code compliance um in some parts of of san jose um versus you know put, putting a lot of attention on adus where we know that it has to be upper middle class or folks who have either equity or money in the bank uh to add that kind of um 
opportunity um, for a rental. Anyways, okay, so let's uh, do roll call. I appreciate you adding the, those those pieces, Rachel. Um, and did I see your uh, hand go up, Council Member Sparza? Are you okay? I'm going to guess that she is okay, not speaking. So go ahead, let's take a roll on this vote. Jimenez? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Uh, yes. Thank you. Wonderful. So that moves on and that leaves us our very last item. And this is Urban Confluence Silicon Valley Project Quarterly Status Report. All right. Thank you, Council Member Nicole Burnham, Deputy Director PRNS. Back again. I think I've worked out the kinks. Um, at least I hope so. I now have Steve Borgenhagen, which is a very important part of this presentation. Uh, so he should still be here. Yes, there he is. Okay, excellent. Whew. So the first two important things are done. Let's see if I can screen share now. And I apologize for my chaos a little earlier. Um, all right, so you should be seeing a presentation, which I'll put into slide mode. So you're seeing presentation, yes? Yeah, so we're, we're seeing that presentation. All right, thank you, just wanted to confirm. Um, so well, I've been doing these quarterly updates for a while. Um, usually I just come in and kind of give you, they've been pretty perfunctory because we've been working through project details and I just sort of kind of tell you where we are. Um, today with me, I have Steve Borkenhagen, the executive director of the Light Tower Corporation. Uh, there's actually been a lot of movement in this project in the last quarter. So I asked him to come today and give you the update himself so you can um, listen to what he has to say and what their current thinking is and then uh, be a, have the opportunity to ask him questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Steve and I'll go to the next slide. Thank you, Nicole. You can advance that, please. In fact, Nicole, would you advance it a few slides? You're going straight to the heart yeah, of the matter? And then, and then we'll, we'll come back to the other ones. But okay. the, the summary of what we've decided to do is that after a lot of study of arena green and uh, i did send an email to all of you both the uh, city staff and council members so thanks for the time today uh, explaining this that we have decided to pause working at arena green due to lots of different challenges and we want to carefully study the possibility of placing breeze at plaza de Ceso chavez which going back to the beginning of our project, we actually thought was the best site for our project. When we did a site study a few years ago, which you at council approved, the site study came up with Arena Green as the uh, top site, but um, it, that site study might have uh, underestimated some of the negatives or challenges of Arena Green, particularly as related to the river and the creek and the riparian corridor. So we're actually excited to do this study of Plaza de Ceso Chavez, we are not abandoning Arena Green. We're simply uh, pausing to do this additional study. So we're working on that analysis now, and we will provide you an update uh, at your next meeting. But I will point out that our strategy is, is to begin by seeing if the family of Cesar Chavez agrees with us that the park does not properly honor Cesar Chavez currently, uh, other than the small letters uh, with his name on the granite stage, there's nothing else that points to or honors Cesar Chavez, who, as we all know, was one of the most important uh, leaders of the civil rights movement of the last hundred years uh, and lived in San Jose for, uh, for a long time. So we think that the combination of Breeze of Innovation and various elements yet to be designed that honor uh, Cesar Chavez could make that park, which we believe is currently a, a mediocre uh, urban park into something really spectacular. There's a lot of opportunity because area around the park uh, is going to be going through a radical transformation with lots of develop development over the next uh, five or 10 years. Nicole, can you go back now to the, the first slides and I'll briefly go over those. So uh, we think that Breeze is a spectacular design that could be modified to fit in well at Plaza de Cesar Chavez, just uh, something that's an interesting coincidence really is that Breeze is a, what, what we might call a modular design where the number of rods could vary dramatically. The first iteration had 500 rods. The second iteration at Arena Green had 1,000 rods and it might, it might be significantly smaller. In fact, it would be significantly smaller at Plaza de Cesar Chavez. Uh, so 
uh, we, we think this is a, a great site for it and that uh, park, parks are extremely important uh, to all of us as citizens. Uh, they're, they're a great social equalizer and do lots of other important things. Next slide, please, Nicole. And uh, again, we think there's this unique moment in our history right now. If you combine Google, uh, Adobe, J. Paul, uh, West Bank, uh, Urban Catalyst and others, there's all kinds of exciting things happening uh, both around the park and around downtown. So this is a unique time for us. Uh, we think that money can be raised because our story resonates for many people uh, to invest their own private money into this. Uh, there have been some people who have pushed back and said that doing art or architecture projects or cultural projects at a time when there's human need is, is unacceptable or inappropriate. And, and I respectfully push back on that. Uh, there have always been struggling people. There will always be struggling people. And there's always, all of us have always spent money on things, whether it's going to an art museum or listening to a concert. So culture always matters. And we don't say either or, but it's really both and. Uh, next slide, please, Nicole. And I already did this slide. What's the next one, Nicole? Or is that the last? So I'm certainly here to answer questions. We're really excited to, to study this possibility. Uh, I'm, I've been working with uh, board members from uh, Chavez Family Vision to get meetings with members of the Chavez family. Uh, we hope our inspiration and story resonates for them. It all begins with them. Then it'll certainly come back to you at council. And also we plan to do uh, really significant community outreach to all of the stakeholders at the park. I've already talked to some of them, but we will meet all of them if uh, we are successful in uh, talking to the family of Cesar Chavez about this idea. And I, I, I want to be real clear that there is no design yet. It's, a, it's an idea. So for, for anyone to claim that there's some kind of fully fleshed out design for the park is just not true yet. Uh, we did have Fer Jerez from Australia uh, via Spain here a couple of weeks ago, and he likes uh, Plaza de Cesar Chavez a lot. And uh, at this point, it's it's really simply the idea of placing Breeze in the park, along with these other yet to be determined elements. So I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. We are going to go uh, to public comment first. Thank you. Shani? Congratulations, Chair Arena, and good afternoon, community members. My name is Shani Kleinhaus. I'm the environmental advocate for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. As light pollution intensifies in San Jose and throughout the planet, the impact of artificial light at night on our natural ecosystems are revealed. Ecological connections and animal health and behavior from the individual level to species and populations are greatly impaired. This is one of the reasons Audubon and other groups opposed the selection of the ecologically sensitive Arena Green site for the project. A recent report by Parkland Consulting commissioned by Urban Confluence team recommended the reconsideration of alternative sites for the project instead of Arena Green, recognizing that this may be, and I quote, painful, especially after all the work that has been completed to date, the report continues, quote, however, in development, the only thing more painful than pivoting is the failure to recognize when certain prior efforts need to be treated as sunk cost that has to be absorbed instead of being treated as co a completed step. For numerous reasons, the report also recommends that the team finds a privately owned rather than a publicly owned site for the project. Now the project is looking to potentially shift to Plaza de Cesar Chavez, the heart of San Jose. For a project of this magnitude, we believe that funding through the life cycle, as well as cultural, logistics, and environmental challenges will continue to be prohibitive, especially if another site that is prominently, prominently visible from a repairing and corridor on the, or the bay is selected. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Dashiell. Hello, my name is Dasha Leeds. I'm the conservation organizer for the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter. Um, we just like to echo Shani's comments from the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. 
Um, we too are extremely concerned about the growing threat of light pollution, not only in San Jose, but across the region. And we're really happy to hear that the um, project will likely be moved away from Arena Green and that there will be a reconsideration of the site selection. Um, we also would like to echo Shini's comments about um, the fact that funding will be difficult in terms of community support, in terms of wherever this is installed. And we also hope that um, whatever the project turns out to be, uh, that it respects the riparian corridors uh, and habitat of this beautiful city. Thank you so much. Lawrence Ames. Yes, hi, Larry Ames, Chair of the District 6 Neighborhood Leadership Group. Hope you've seen our letter. We want to thank Steve Borkenhagen and the San Jose Light Corporation for their love of San Jose. We love San Jose too. We have major concerns with the proposed project, especially in the initial plans to place it by an environmentally sensitive stream site habitat and all the impacts it would have on the wildlife, migrating birds, and even spawning salmon. With all the jobs and housing planned for the downtown West District, we need to keep Arena Green as a publicly usable public park. The affordable and market rate housing being built nearby will not come with private backyards and the Arena Green will become their main source of outdoor living. We now hear that there's talk of reciting this project to the Plaza de Cesar Chavez. It has much less environmental impact, so yay, we're happy for that. But the Plaza is the very heart of San Jose and it is already very well used summer concerts, Christmas in the parks, year round it is the outflow from the civic and convention centers events and it's the staging areas for field trips to the tech. There is a privately funded draft concept plan from 2018 for, plaza, for the plaza that aims to honor Cesar Chavez more than just a name on the park. The plan does talk about including a light tower in its fairly historic form but it is, not, it is shown as spanning a street nearby or standing on an island in a, in a street island, not taking city park land. And it is shown as an ornamental feature enhancing the park rather than as a major attraction that would dominate the park. If you must build a tower, please also buy the land for it. Make us a park, do not take our parks. And we wish that your gift could be something useful rather than just something frivolous. Help us with the equity imbalances by funding perhaps scholarships for people to go to family camp or build sustainable park improvements. Or if you do want to give us an iconic structure, help us enhance. Jason Minsky. Good afternoon, uh, Jason Minsky, Executive Director of Christmas in the Park. I have spoken uh, with Steve Borgenhagen about the project, uh, brought it up to our board of directors, uh, as previously mentioned by the Speaker before me, Christmas in the Park obviously does utilize uh, Plaza de Cesar Chavez every year. We bring about 650 to 750,000 people to the downtown area during the holiday season for our free event. Um, our, our concern obviously uh, is once the designs uh, do come to fruition that we, that we have a say um, because we are kind of already bursting at the seams. Uh, and if you've ever been to Christmas in the Park on a Saturday night. It tends to get very crowded. Uh, the, the scope of this work could take up a, a big chunk of this two and a half acre park. Um, so I appreciate Steve basically saying that, you know, there are no designs yet that he will definitely include stakeholders such as ourselves. Uh, one thing that Christmas in the Park would like to ask, and, and this kind of goes to the, the folks at the Neighborhood Services uh, and Education Committee is, we would like to know the process um, for something like this being approved. Uh, how the city deals with these suggestions, uh, what sort of uh, permitting process, votes need to take place, et cetera, so that we can be an informed group uh, who definitely has a, a, a stake in Plaza de Cesar Chavez Park. Um, so thank you very much uh, for the time. Thank you, Steve. Uh, you know, I know that the, the intentions are, are very good from you and your organization. We do look forward to working with you on the project, but we definitely wanna make sure that it, it doesn't negatively affect uh, our event as we've discussed before moving forward. Thank you. Jill Borders. Hi, thank you. This is Jill Borders, a District 10 rev resident, lifelong San Jose resident. And I just, I have to put in my two cents here. I want to also acknowledge the person who spoke on behalf of the project and who's working so hard to have something like this um, in San Jose, but I, I respectfully must say that every person I talk to 
does not like this design. It does not, it, it, I have a, personally, I have a, a visceral reaction to it. It makes me feel uncomfortable. It makes me feel like a, a sense of anxiety. Um, and I'm not sure what that's about, but it really has affected me. Every, even when I look at the pictures, I feel like I'm approaching some sort of strange temple, um, uh, sort of this odd religious experience. And I just mentioned this because it, it's really important to me that we get the tone right. We're turning the corner. We've made this massive investment in Coyote Valley. We're trying our hardest to protect our environment. We're doing all of these things in acknowledgement that our planet is suffering. And this just seems like the height of, of hubris, quite frankly. Um, and I just hope you will sincerely take this message as not one of being um, cruel. I hear what you're saying about art. We always need art. Art should always be with us in times of lack and in times of, you know, great wealth. But this isn't something that is speaking to the majority of the people that I know. And so I, I just sincerely hope you will consider um, this project at all. I just do not think it belongs in San Jose. Our beautiful hillsides, our mountainsides being in this valley and looking all the way around us um, at the immense beauty, this actually is just nothing in comparison to that. Thank you. Jean Dresden. Thank you. My, good afternoon. My name is Jean Dresden and I'm a longtime park advocate. It's exciting when community members step forward and volunteer their time and resources for our parks when they bring their ideas and then work with the park system to conform to the local master plan. The proponents hope for an iconic park, and this is a key assumption. Many art projects are built, yet most don't achieve iconic status and fail to become the major tourist draws the proponents hope for. Iconic is like catching lightning in a bottle. It's rare. I'm surprised that the proponents did not further explain their request for the plaza by further describing their consultant's analysis that the project is infeasible at the Arena Green site. About five years ago, city staff released a conceptual investigation of Plaza de Cesar Chavez improvements to meet the concerns of the many permittees for the arrangement of the park and its size. And if the council moves forward with this project, it will reduce the event space. Please ask for an analysis on the economic impact to downtown if the smaller event space pushes event pr producers to leave downtown for lack of space. What would downtown be like without San Jose Jazz or Christmas in the Park or the other events that have come through? The same report proposes that the northern traffic median uh, would be a good place for a replica light tower on space not usable for events and not chartered parkland. A light tower artwork on that traffic median would be welcome. A year ago, cancel, council asked for significant outreach. It hasn't happened. Please ask for a projectable survey with good sampling practices for diversity to take a look at community reaction. Juan Estrada. Dear committee members, my name is Juan Estrada and I represent Green Foothills, which has protected open space farmlands and natural resources in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties for 60 years. We oppose this large, heavily lit project in an environmentally sensitive, sensitive area at the confluence of Guadalupe River and Los Gatos Creek and the use of precious public open space. We think modifications to lighting at that site are unlikely to solve the problem short of dramatic redesign that basically eliminates lighting as part of the design. Our concern has always been the nighttime lighting next to the creek corridor will negatively impact local species. Dark creek corridors are essential for wildlife and these creeks support threatened fish species, migratory birds, and the occasional beaver. All depend on darkness in their lives. In fact, birds' migratory behavior is altered by light and this design would be a death sentence to some. Fatalities result from the amount of energy they waste flying around and calling out in confusion, exhaustion that can then leave them vulnerable to other urban threats. We're also long past the time when we didn't appreciate the fact that people 
benefit from a healthy ecosystem. For instance, there is a growing body of evidence that indicates the presence and viewing of urban wildlife is beneficial for human mental health and psychological well-being. Lastly, science tells us that light pollution generators should be perceived as any other source of contamination due to pervasive and devastating effects on health and nature. It may be prudent for supporters to consider the possibility that the problem isn't just the site, but the design as well. The current design would continually waste energy. Changing the location wouldn't fix that issue. The proponents might be faced in the future with having to change a new location again, whether that's an alternative currently being studied or suggested such as Coyote Meadows. It might be time to go back to the drawing board. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. I see Council Member Jimenez's hand up. Go right ahead. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say uh, certainly thank you to all the folks that have called in and chimed in with their opinion. Appreciate that. Uh, I also appreciate Steve your uh, your your committee's work on this. I I actually particularly think it's this this it, it's beautiful and and uh, uh, I really do think uh, that your point as it relates to cultural cu cultural sort of uh, things that we're moving forward or artwork generally it, it, it's always a good time to do that and I'm very supportive of that. I do acknowledge, though, that there are, I envision that there's going to be some constraints at Plaza Chavez. And so, um, you know, I, I think, as you pointed out very well, we're, we're at the start of some of these conversations. And so I appreciate you bringing this forward. And I certainly look forward to hearing and getting more information about what the ideas are. Um, I, I guess I just had one question, and that is, you know, I, I haven't gone back. I, ha I just got an email, but I haven't opened it up uh, to go back to the initial sort of thorough analysis that was done when when you all landed at the arena, arena green site. So I have to go back and look and see if any other locations were considered apart from Plaza Cesar Chavez. But can you enlighten me? And, and are there any other parks? I mean, what comes to mind for me, for example, is it seems to me that St. James Park, for example, is probably larger than Plaza Cesar Chavez. I don't know if that's true, Nicole. Uh, but I'm wondering if other parks like that here in the downtown area were considered before you all landed and maybe going forward with Plaza Esa Chavez. Nicole, do you want me to take that? Sure. Um, first, th thanks for the comment, Sergio. Uh, some of the sites were uh, also close to the river, so we were not going to switch working on one site next to the river to another site working on the river because it wouldn't solve the whole challenge of riparian corridor. So Discovery Meadow was one of the sites studied along with Arena Green, along with Park Avenue near the Center for Performing Arts, which also was on the river, along with Guadalupe Gardens, which is also on the river. And then the, the non-riparian sites would include uh, St. James Park, Arena Green, excuse me, St. James Park, Plaza de Cesar Chavez, and um, uh, Nicole, help me. Uh, I think we looked at the plaza outside of Deirdre didn't we? And Deer, thank you. And the Deer Don the area, one. which is near the river, but was really eliminated because of the complexity of trying to do anything related to the whole Google project and Deer Don Station. Just too many uh, challenges could take 20 years to do it. So that left us with Plaza de Cesar Chavez and and St. James Park. And we, we have considered St. James Park and we might consider it in the future, but our group clearly favors and has always favored Plaza de Cesar Chavez as being the true heart of our city going all the way back to the Pueblo days. So mm -hmm. it's, a it's a matter of preference, not the matter of uh, the potential to put Breeze uh, in St. James Park, which in, in theory could happen. Yeah, and, I, and I'm certainly not recommending that, but I just say it's what came to mind, right? Because Nicole, that is a bigger park, is that correct? I know the uh, shape I, is different, but- it, I, I think it mostly it's a different shape. I don't know that it acreage wise, okay. it's truly bigger. Okay. Yeah, but, and you know, and I mentioned that park because what comes to mind is some of the work around the Levitt Pavilion and such, and I'm wondering if it could really be, uh, you know, placemaking, if you will, at its highest level, as it relates to maybe, you know, the eventually eventual installation of Levitt Pavilion and then having this there. Um, you know, the challenge I think you probably already assume is gonna exist is, if you're putting this at any of those parks, uh, there's a lot of buildings around, right? So I'm not exactly sure what the view is going to be like. It just may be at the top of the park and maybe peer over to some of the windows from the neighboring buildings. So I suspect that's going to be a challenge. Um, 
But, uh, but you know, I, I more generally speaking think that we as a city can do both, right? We can strive to protect our green space and be sensitive to the environment and the lighting and things of that nature and, and also have, uh, you know, which I think, is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm supportive of this and I think it's a beautiful piece, uh, at least how it's been described. Uh, and so I think we, we, we're, we should be able to find a way to help facilitate a location for this. Um, Steve, I guess the, the other question that comes to mind is, have you, and I'm sure, I know you guys are all, your committee has talked to folks at Google, but is, is there a possibility to embed this a little bit more deeply within the Google development, uh, which can really create more vibrancy as it relates to what, what they're trying to do there in their space? We, we had that conversation, Sergio. They're too far along for anything that's of the scale that we're talking about to, in essence, uh, uh, fit it into their project. So we, we always thought that was what you just said was a great idea, but it's not going to happen. And we did have a very specific conversation with Google about it. And one other comment I want to make on your other question about size is that this 2018 study by SWA Reed Yoland that some people were referring to talk um, after getting lots of community input, it it uh, discussed the idea of taking away at least the parking area around the park and maybe even a lane of traffic to expand the footprint of the park. Uh, no decision was ever made, but I will tell you that if you read that study, there, there was a lot of positive energy among the stakeholders to at a minimum get rid of to get a, rid of the parking, which is parking for 30 or 40 cars or something like that around the park instead of uh, what would be thousands of additional square feet of park space. So that de decision hasn't been made yet, but that would certainly be something that would be part of a, of a any kind of a master plan or something like that that's done at the park. Yeah, so, there, so, so potentially expanding the park, right? Making the park a little bigger to be able to accommodate whatever goes there. Okay, all right. <laughs> cool, cool. And, and the last thing I would just say is that I appreciate you talking to uh, the Chavez family and the, the, the folks that are around sort of advocating and trying to uh, make sure that his legacy lives on. I think that's an important component. Uh, there's also a, a Quetzalcoatl, uh, you know, a statue, if you will, on one end of the park. So uh, for me, at least, it'd be important to preserve that. And, you know, if that needs to be relocated, that, that's fine. But, you know, th th there's some sensitivity around <laughs> that, that particular park on a number of different levels. And so, but I appreciate you having conversations. Good to hear that you're uh, engaging some of the folks from Christmas in the park to even now, you know, music in the park, I'm sure is going to be happening pretty soon. And so, so that, that's the thing that I, I, I just curious if you're going to be able to um, address all the concerns that are going to stem from those, fr fr from those uh, entities and those folks uh, while still moving the project forward. So I look forward to getting more information and thank you so much for all your efforts. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sergio. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Suarezo. Um, thank you for the update. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to think how to respond, to be honest with you. Um, I, uh, you know, I think that there are many legitimate concerns about the impact to our environment at the green, Arena Green location. I'll, I'll tell you that, um, I also echo the concerns about Christmas in the park. It's a huge tradition uh, for not just for our city, but it brings folks from all over the region and probably farther. Um, and we learned to our uh, detriment way back when we talked about, you know, when we shifted it from the city to others, we were looking at possibly getting rid of it all those years ago. And we learned very quickly as a city how passionate people are about Christmas in the park in the Plaza de Cesar Chavez. Um, and, uh, and that to me also shows us that that plaza exists for the people and it exists in having been out there and seeing the children and families uh, come out and enjoy it, um, that it supports, um, as you know, uh, <laughs> you very well know, our local small businesses and, um, and, and uh, it's just become part of San Jose uh, civic life, right? And um, uh, and and uh, I, I'll tell you though where my mixed feelings are is the Plaza de Cesar Chavez should not be a consolation location. 
it, it's not a backup. It's, it's a location that has a tremendous amount of meaning for folks in the city. Um, it is it is the people's plaza, right? A lot of folks, there's the stage area and community groups use it. Um, you know, we've seen it used for protests, which is very much in keeping with, uh, with the name. Um, it's been used for uh, cultural uh, uh, um, performances. It's used for so many things. Um, and, and I'll tell you, I, I, I respect uh, Council Member Jimenez very much, but I'll tell you, you'll have a big fight on your hands if you try to relocate that statue from where it is now. Um, I, I don't think that is the message that we want to send to our community um, to move uh, a statue that yes, whatever your thoughts on it, um, it would be incredibly disrespectful to a community that has been here um, in San Jose from, from, you know, for a long time. Um, and so uh, my preference, my question is for, I'm not, I'm not sure whether it's Nicole or Steve, but as part of the reassessment of locations, um, can we reassess, like we going back to that list that you read off earlier? May I take that, Nicole? Uh, you sure can. Thank you. Um, yeah, council members, as far as uh, we we went through the entire list already, our board did a careful analysis of all of them. And as I, as I said earlier, anything that was near the river got eliminated. So we were really left, left with uh, uh, St. James Park and, um, and Plaza de Cesar Chavez, which we have always favored all the way to the beginning uh, of our project five years ago. Um, and just to speak to a couple of the points you make, we are not, we've made no comment about Quetzalcoatl and have no interest in relocating it, touching it or doing anything to it. So that if, if anybody uh, attributed that to us, it's, it's, that's not correct. Uh, and also Christmas in the Park and San Jose Jazz, I've already met with, and that those are just the first meetings with stakeholders because they're the two most important user stakeholders. We have no intention of relocating any of the activities in the park. The question that we're going to every organization, every stakeholder with is how can we make the park better for you? If we can't make the park better for Christmas in the Park or San Jose Jazz or, or the Downtown Association or anybody else, then they, they should oppo oppose the project because it's their home, the same as it is for Quetzalcoatl. So we're not in opposition to anyone, we're, we're going to use the best practices and process to get all the stakeholders, which would include neighbors, you know, the new Signia Hotel, Convention Center, uh, the tech and everyone else and say and ask them the same question. How can we make the park better for you? I would contend the park is currently mediocre at best and it could be spectacular by by adding new elements and just doing a better job of everything that a park's supposed to do. So that that's our goal. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Um, and um... You know, the other thing I will say is, uh, so I have a question on the St. James Park idea. Um, we're moving forward on that. Is this an element that could be integrated, Nicole, into our work with St. James Park? At this point, council member, I think that would be a little bit, I mean, nothing's impossible, right? Mm -hmm. um, but at this point, we have a design and an approved environmental impact report. Um, we're advancing the next stage of design. And if we added this kind of element in, I think we'd need to go back and redo the EIR. It's not impossible. It's Which nobody time wants to do. Yeah. It's just time yeah. and money, right? So I get it. I get um, for, it. yeah. it's feasible. Is it viable, you know, or practical um, is a bit of a different question. We had talked about St. James early on um, as a location when we were doing the site selection study. And there definitely is some, there was some opportunity there and some, some, interesting opportunity potentially. Um, yeah, it just seems like a better fit, to be honest. I mean, my childhood church is right there. And and as I spoke when this came to council, gosh, when was it a year ago or a year and a half ago? Um, you know, uh, my whole life, St. James Park has had issues, right? And, and I would love to see that turn around, um, you know, as a lifelong San Josean, I would love to see um, St. James Park be, uh, be amazing. Um, and uh, it seems like uh, an, uh, a locally funded effort um, around art could be integrated into 
this, it, it's a massive turnaround that we're trying to do for St. James Park. Um, it would be great to integrate it, but it sounds like that's not practical. I'll, um, in terms of just giving feedback, I will also say that if, um, you know, I, I'm not sold on Plaza de Cesar Chavez as a location. Um, if, if that were a location, I'd prefer to see a design that um, was specific to that location and how it's used. And um, I know a tremendous amount of work has gone into the design, but we really want to put the right thing in the right place um, for the benefit, excuse me, for the benefit of the community. And I'll stop there, Madam Chair. Thanks. Thank you. I'm also going to add to the comments. Um, I think that if uh, I, I also uh, do not like this uh, um, relocation choice for uh, Plaza de Cesar Chavez, one, it's very underinvested. And if we needed to have an investment in it, I think it's because we want to improve it for our community members with our community members input um, and for it to be an, uh, a process that they got to participate in rather than something that's imposed on them. Um, and so I, I also agree that if this site is considered, which I, I highly discourage, um, I don't know that it's enough to speak to the Chavez Foundation. I think it, needs a conversation with our city and with our residents um, because this is their home. This is where we all go downtown for not only Christmas in the park, but if we want some uh, real, a real nice dinner or some luxurious um, dessert, or if we wanna see a play or just stay in a fancy hotel, we go downtown and uh, this, this not only uh, deserves a conversation with the Chavez Foundation, and it deserves a, a conversation with our residents. And I think we would have to really um, start from um, from zero on this. And uh, and it and it would have to be um, not self serving, but it would have to come from a, uh, the origin would be to see how we can improve the park, not to fit something else in, but overall just to um, improve the park. So while I'm on that subject, I'm, I'm wondering, what is the investment? What's the plan for Cesar Chavez Park? Um, because I'm not including this as part of the next steps. Um, I think that might be directed at me. So we had in 2017, um, and you heard the, the community mention it, we had done, um, thanks to funding from the Knight Foundation, um, master initial kind of master planning. Um, it had been a long time since we had looked at that park and really made a major investment in it. Uh, Knight was gracious enough to fund a consultant to do some evaluation. I worked on that with Office of Economic Development, as well as our partners at DOT. Um, and we worked with the with the downtown community um, and developed some concepts of what could be there and what the opportunities were. Um, ultimately, that uh, there's a study, but we didn't we have not yet taken it anywhere, right? I mean, the, so there's this you know in our capital program there's this you know list of needs, and among them is needs for improvement at Plaza de Cesar Chavez. That would you know we would take that study and advance it and refine it and and try to identify the opportunities um, for that site. But we very much were focused on enhancing the. Um, ability of that site to really, in a robust way, support concerts and the concert venue. One of the things it doesn't have is any kind of green room. So we have, you know, we have a stage, but there's no, there's no rigging for lights. There's no shade canopy every year. We put that in on as a temporary installation. Mm -hmm. um, and then artists need a green room. They need a place where they can get ready um, for their performances. So there's fundamental things that make this a challenging location right now for, for performances. So we looked at enhancing that, enhancing the art opportunities here, specifically centered around honoring Cesar Chavez. Um, 
uh, and, and ensuring that, you know, Christmas in the park could still fit. And we looked at how the space worked um, and also in context of Circle of Palms, Tech Interactive, you know, all of the uses that are there and, 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 and that everybody has mentioned. Um, it, so ultimately that's, that, that study is sitting in a queue waiting for, for work to be refined and, and to be funded for construction. Um, well, that is um, disheartening. Um, I, I it, anyway, oh, yeah, I, I'm not going to go further on that, but it is very disheartening to hear that we just left it as is. But I know that you know the the main issues there are probably money, uh, although downtown has um, probably the, the largest investment in development um, than probably any part of of the city. Um, I, I, and I, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was saying, yeah, and I, I, I honor that response, and I, I, I hear the frustration and feel it. Um, I think funding is one thing. You know, we've been focused on funding St. James. That has been there's a council direction that that's a priority. Um, uh, we also have a lot of competing interests. You know, for a pretty small capital team trying to knock out projects in partnership with Public Works, and so it's just we have a long, long list of backlog. Unfortunately, um, it's frustrating for us as much as it is for you. Trust me. Yeah. No, I I get it. Um, uh, I didn't mean to make it about that, um, but it certainly plays a part, and and I get that, Nicole. Um, so I would understand why we would want to maybe partner with a private um, entity uh, to improve the site. Um, I just don't think that this is going to be the site that um, is the most appropriate um, for many of the reasons that have already been stated. And so um, I think this, Karen, goes uh, to council, correct, as a report? I don't believe there's a cross reference. Okay, so what is what is the next step, Nicole, in this? I think that's a good question, um, and I think this is our opportunity to really talk about that. Um, and I and and I'll invite Angel to weigh in if he'd like to. But um, I think at this point, you know, so so Steve laid out, you know, they they came to us and said we you know we're we'd like to think about looking in a different location. We didn't say yes, and we didn't say no. We, you know, it's kind of the, they wanted to take this initiative and do it on their own. Um, and so they have been proceeding in that manner. And we've been watching, but not, you know, we're not fully participating, I would say. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not regularly meeting to discuss it. Um, I think we're thinking the next step is, you know, eventually the, the project is going to submit some kind of concept plan that we could then react to. And I think maybe that's, at some point, I think it's clear to us, we do need to come back to council because the direction right now is arena green. And so if there's gonna be formal request for Plaza, um, I think we're gonna to need to go to council. I think before we do that, I think there need, you know, I think um, the developer needs to advance their plans and actually put forward some concepts and Angel, I see you unmuted, I'll let you chime in. Yeah, yeah, you know, from a process standpoint, so 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 this project is not an official city project yet. Um, the background is is that there was a a request made to council and approved by council for them to explore different locations. Uh, the last decision point was the Arena Green site, and that was. Uh, and then since that time, you know, there's been a number of different environmental concerns. So I think uh, the group has pivoted to looking at other options. Uh, right now, this is just an update uh, for them to take this feedback back to their group in terms of, you know, the continued exploration. Um, and then based on kind of how that feedback is vetted internally, you know, within the organization, uh, ultimately, in terms of any type of site selection, that would still need to undergo further conversations with Parks Recreation Neighborhood Services, uh, and then ultimately a recommendation to the full council for approval. So as of right now, this is just part of the, uh, the feedback process. Got it. Okay, well, I think the, the feedback is there. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think pretty clear um, as far as the, uh, some of us who are here uh, are saying that this is not the right place. Um, but let me hear what uh, Councilmember Jimenez, I think, 
uh, wants to add. Go ahead. So, so, so just the, the first thing I'd like to say is I, I <laughs> to the extent my comments were taken out of context, I never said, well, I don't, I hope I didn't relay that I think this is the right place. I, my sense of what's happening is here is that Steve's group is out there exploring <laughs> whether this location makes sense. And so um, that, that's what I wanted to express. Also, I was hoping, I mean, Steve, if you have any comment as relates to the next steps in your mind, in your organization's mind, but I've also, I'll also be curious. I mean, I, I expect that Nicole or Angel, once they get a little further down the line, this is going to come back to our committee, I assume. And then from there, potentially, well, I, I imagine cross reference to the pool council, correct? Yeah, from a process standpoint, that's correct. Uh, okay. all, you know, all, all updates have been referred to Neighborhood Services and Education Committee. Uh, and then w once the group is ready, you know, after they've done their full exploration, community engagement of, of any sites that they're considering, they would come back with a formal recommendation vetted first by this committee, cross-reference to the full council. Cool, cool, cool. Well, I, I'm totally open and, you know, approach this when with an open mind, Steve. At least that's the perspective of, uh, uh, of this committee member. And, uh, would you share with us sort of what your ideas are as to the process? Yes, th thank you again, Sergio. Uh, Council Member Arenas, just to be clear, uh, in addition to the Chavez family, our intention would be to communicate with every stakeholder, in including, in essence, all the citizens of our city. Obviously, we can't reach out to a million people, but we would try to get to every group that, that cares about parks, that cares about downtown, that cares about uh, Plaza de Cesar Chavez, uh, again, the, the family of Cesar Chavez is just the beginning of it for obvious uh, reasons of respect. So uh, Nicole and John Cicerelli and, um, and Angel and others have given, uh, given us that advice, which is what we intended to do anyway. So we would see the process as reporting back to you at your next meeting in three months. And doing this research, uh, again, I, I think Sergio said it well, that we, we need to do lots of research and bring you lots of data and if, if, the community, if the community and you and no one else wants our project, then you know, we, we will go back to the drawing board. We, you know, we love the site, some do, some don't. Um, many people do, I'll say, based on my, my uh, travels around, around downtown. But, but uh, to answer the question about process, we would wanna just do lots of research and come back to you. And we would ask PRNS uh, probably to help us to make sure that we do the process correctly so that we give you what you want so that you can make a, a good decision for yourselves. Okay, that, that makes sense to me. And so, so I guess, I think there was an earlier question about what next steps are. So do we need a motion to accept the report? Yes, typically we would because that's how it's agendized as yeah. acceptance of the report. Right, okay, so I'll, I'll move to accept the report and I look forward to getting information later to figure out what the next steps are. Thank you. Um, what I would like to see is, um, it, it depends who, who those stakeholders are that you will be approaching. Um, and what is um, disturbing me is that the question isn't whether, um, whether our residents want it there. The question, you've already posed the question as, do you want to hear or do you, or do you want it or somewhere else? Um, I think that we should have a question about whether we want it at all and where it should, it should go and not a suggestion that it should go at Cesar Chavez Park um, because you've set your eyes on this um, park. Um, because depending on how you pose those questions, you'll get the answers that maybe uh, play into the, the answers that you'd like. Um, so I, I don't know if maybe you could have a, a third party. I just, I'm feeling very uncomfortable about um, moving forward with this process um, and already predetermining that Cesar Travis Park is the best location. Um, and not even having a, a, a number of choices uh, to pick from. Uh, I'll be honest, I think because you've already run into this issue that um, maybe what uh, the community, what you'll find our community telling you is that it would be wonderful to have this art piece 
that is developed by a local San Jose native that reflects um, the culture and um, the feel and progress that San Jose has made. And I think you'll find um, that the, the uh, current uh, breeze as, as uh, great as it looks, I don't know if it, this is an iconic, and I've always had this, this is not the first time that I've said this, I don't identify, I'm a San Josean born and raised. I, I don't identify with it. This is not how my city is going to be known in the same way that San Francisco is known for leaving your heart in San Francisco and you find those hearts all throughout, you know, the Embarcadero and, and Union Square and just different part, uh, different um, neighborhoods. And nobody has to really think twice about it. We all know why those hearts um, and art pieces are there. I just, I struggle with uh, figuring out what that identity is and that, that, um, Structural will identify us rather than we identify the structure. Um, so it, it is um, it's problematic to say the least, um, at least for me. Uh, Council Member Esparza. Thank you. Um, so I actually, I had a question. I, um, I think that uh, and I already stated this, so I won't rehash it too much. I, I, I think that the, the right project should go in the right location. I don't think that we should try to make a square peg fit in a round hole because we predetermined or someone has predetermined that, 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 that it should be at the plaza. Uh, personally, I disagree with that. And uh, stakeholders include a lot of people. It includes the downtown business community. It includes... The Christmas in the Park and San Jose Jazz, um, uh, and and those are organizations Steve knows very well. I, I get that, uh, but also uh, the community, uh, the geographic community, and specifically the Native and the Latino community, because this location is very symbolic, um, and you know this design, um, in my opinion, is not suited for this location, um, and so. It is, should we do it at all? What are the locations that we should do? Um, you know, we should be trying to find the right project for the right place, right? And, um, and so I had a question for Angel. Um, this has taken a left turn. And so um, should we, in accepting this report, refer it to council for an update? And if so, when? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. You know, um, you know, if, if we kind of go back and, you know, to, to when this, this idea was first proposed, per, perhaps it's going back to that point where, where perhaps the group goes back and considers uh, various locations, you, you know, um, and, and kind of, you know, especially now that they have a little bit more feedback from architects and other consultants that, that they've been working with in terms of other locations, as well as they've had an opportunity to hear this feedback from this committee today. And they've heard uh, a lot of feedback from environmental uh, perspectives. Um, and, and perhaps they kind of go back and take a look at just all the options all over again, and then uh, come back to this committee with an update of those options and then cross-reference at that point. Um, okay, that makes okay. sense. Um, and and I would also um, include the options should be that should be considered um, should include a design that fits for Arena Green, right? If Arena Green is what was started with as a location to um, to invigorate, and uh, you know we have the sharks there. I mean, it's part of civic life in San Jose. Um, and if the idea is to really enhance that civic life at that location, um, then perhaps an a, a, a redesign um, should, should be included in the mix and, and to address that because, um, again, the right project for the right location. But I'll, I'll, I agree with that and um, 
do we need to give direction and emotion, uh, that direction and emotion, or um, is everybody hearing that right now? I think it'd be helpful to have the direction and the motion. I think uh, Council Member Jimenez made the original motion, okay. so he would have to, this is essentially a friendly amendment to that. Yeah. So Okay, so I just wanted to make to sure. That. So Council Member Jimenez, would you mm -hmm. take a friendly amendment to, um, to include uh, as as all the options that um, that Angel just stated in going back and revisiting, you know, the list and the locations and fleshing out the options and bringing that to us so that we can cross reference to council. Yeah, I guess I thought that's what we were doing. I mean, Steve's going to go. They're going to do the work. They're going to come back to this committee and then we're going to cross reference it to the council. So, I, I assume that's what that's what we were doing okay well now it's explicitly stated right yeah. so yeah. okay awesome thank you appreciate that mm -hmm. all right thank you um I, i'm sorry steve i didn't see your hand raised because it's blended into your background i apologize uh go, go right ahead thank you uh just briefly just a reminder that we have had three unanimous approvals of council. The first one a few years ago was essentially just to proceed on the project. And then and then after that, it was approving Arena Green as a site. And then after that, it was approving, uh, about a year ago, you all approved uh, unanimously proceeding on Breeze of Innovation. So uh, I just wanna point out, we, we haven't existed in a vacuum. We've, we've really been good soldiers and come back three times. But the, the point about Breeze of Innovation at Plaza de Cesar Chavez, which is a different site, is, is well taken. And it is uh, an interesting anomaly of the Breeze of Innovation design, unlike most of the thousand submittals we got, which were, I, I would call, radically or completely site-specific to Arena Green. It just happens that Breeze of Innovation is this, what we might call a modular design that's actually very flexible. So one can have one's own opinion about whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. But uh, I, I know that one of the things that we'll point out if, if you ask us to sort of formally study Breeze at Plaza de Cesar Chavez is the flexibility of it because it's got this modular aspect to it, whether it's, as I said earlier, 500 rods, 1,000 rods, 100 rods, whatever number of rods are needed to, to create critical mass. So I just wanted to remind you of the, the history. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Um, we recognize that, that we voted on this in the past and we recognize the, the project and thank you for the reminder. Council Member Sparza. I, I appreciate that. I think we know what we voted on um, and uh, we have voted on updates um, and we voted to allow the group to continue to move forward to study it. Um, and we voted to limit staff time because there were a lot of concerns about staff time. So we didn't say, hey, go do all of this thing and build out the lights and agree and agree. I, I, I do agree that, you know, we have been updated. There has been that communication there, which is great. Um, and you're right, it has not been ha going on in a vacuum at all. Um, but we did not uh, explicitly um, do that. We accepted reports, we accepted um, the concept, but we did not accept the design. And so I'd like to be very clear on that because the council did not vote to say, yes, do exactly this. We voted to, um, to accept the concept of having this project there, um, but what we're doing right now, now that we're at a left turn with a, a change it put in front of us is we are now giving feedback saying, hey, um, which is our job um, and to give that feedback at where we are right now. That's it for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, let's do a roll call vote. Ms. Barza? Yes. Jimenez? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Great. Thank you. That finalizes our agenda. And the only item left is public forum. Um, well, we're going to go to the public comment for this. Don't see anybody's hand raised. Am I correct? 
All right, well, this concludes our meeting, our committee meeting for Neighborhood Services and Education Committee. We'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.